Hi folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Bill Gatton and I want to uh, spend a little time talking to you about the Equity Holding Trust Transfer System which uh, is um, basically using an Illinois type third-party trustee title holding um, a co-beneficiary land trust at its center. Now bear in mind as we go through this this program that the equity holding trust is not intended to be another form of created financing. What it is, it's intended and designed to be the way to do all of those other forms of creative financing, including lease options and equity shares and contracts for deeds and all-inclusive mortgages and lease purchase and, uh, and so on. So don't, don't presume that we're trying to teach you something new. We're just trying to teach you how to do all the old stuff better safer and a more in a more legally pure way now the equity holding trust really is nothing complicated uh, it simply saves you a lot of trouble and legal exposure by allowing you to transfer real estate by means of a beneficial uh, interest in a silent uh, land trust versus a publicly recorded deed so what can an understanding of the Illinois Land Trust and its use, uh, especially with regard to the Open Door Wealth Management Equity Holding Trust uh, do, um, or allow you to do that other people simply can't do because they don't know how? Uh, well, for number, uh, number one, the Equity Holding Trust will allow you to legitimately, and without the need uh, for subterfuge or deceit, acquire income property all day long for your clients or for yourself without a down payment, without a loan application, and without a bank's credit review process. It avoids any lenders due on sale admonitions uh, regarding uh, uh, unauthorized transfer of ownership or the assignment of a payment stream for an existing mortgage. It effectively shields the property from judgment liens by virtually anybody, including uh, outside judgment creditors, uh, the bankruptcy, um, uh, disgruntled uh, spouse in a divorce process, and so on. Number four, shifts an owner's legal exposure regarding the property to the trustee who holds the property as its legal owner. The trustee and a land trust holds the ownership legally and equitably for the benefit of the director of the trust, which is the beneficiary or the beneficiaries of that, uh, that trust. So if somebody's going to sue you and they think they're going to get to your property, you got another thing coming because when they check the title, they'll find out you don't own it. And it's owned by a corporation. You've given the property over to a corporation to own for you and own under your directions as to what they're supposed to do with the title, when they're supposed to revoke the trust, and leave, leaving you completely 100% in charge. So number five, uh, the equity owning trust keeps all dealings relative to the property completely private and unrecorded. Uh, and shields uh, the data regarding title ownership from public view. It's a fact that only the deed transfer to the trustee is ever recorded in the public record. And that means no other name show up on title and any further information about the trust would be accessible only by court order. Which means that you can have 100% of the benefits of owning the property, including tax write-off and uh, um, appreciation, equity build-up, principal reduction, everything you can get in fee simple ownership without your name being in the public record. So if somebody's going to sue you, they're going to have a very tough time finding out uh, what you own and whether you're worth suing. Number seven, income tax accounting and reporting is uh, simplified with the, um, the use of the land trust in that uh, a settlor beneficiary can treat the transaction as still owning an income property or he can treat it as a sale if he wants to, depending on the, how the documents are structured. The r resident beneficiary in an equity holding trust will treat the, uh, the transaction as if he just owned a property and take all the benefits of income tax write-off for uh, mortgage interest and property tax. Number eight, the equity trust allows an owner to sell, note the quotation marks around sell, mortgage interest and property tax write-off to a tenant beneficiary who is leasing the property, which is typically, typically done in exchange for higher rental income and freedom from the burdens and costs of management and maintenance. Now the reason the word sell is in, in quotation marks, obviously one can't sell tax benefits to somebody. However, 
one can position someone, uh, uh, such as in the trust arrangement, uh, to be able to take the tax benefits as long as they qualify. And in, in this case, it would be qualifying under Section 163 of the Internal Revenue Code. It's uh, uh, specifically 163, subparagraph H4D, which uh, relates to estates and trusts, wherein the the uh, equitable interest is held by a trust. Number nine, the third party nature of the land trust prevents disputes and dishonesty and potential untoward action, but, uh, actions between or among the beneficiaries relative to contractual matters. And this is so because the uh, beneficiaries can't really do anything relative to the title or the ownership of the house without the express mutually agreed uh, direction of the trustee. So as you can see from that, the function of the co-beneficiary land trust is very closely related to or analogous to the properties being held in escrow for the term of the trust. Uh, as you know, in an escrow, the buyer and the seller uh, enter a um, uh, transactional period wherein the escrow officer or the, the, um, the closing official uh, holds the deed to the property and the equitable interest remains with the seller. In other words, the escrow uh, offer, officer or closing official uh, holds the legal title to the property and the equitable title remains with the seller until such time as the escrow closes, at which point the escrow officer and the seller will transfer their ownership interest uh, to the new buyer. And that's kind of what happens in a, um, in a title holding trust in that the trustee holds the legal and the equitable title throughout the term of the trust. So anybody who wants to do anything relative to the property that's not already included in their uh, contract is going to have to get the permission of the trustee. And they can't do that unless everybody's in complete accord and, and agreement and that any direction would be to the legal owner, uh, the trustee, and would have to be expressly agreed to and constructively delivered, certified mail, for example, or nothing uh, changes. Now, let's, let's kind of change the subject just a little bit here and talk about some comforting facts. Well, these comforting facts are really not very comforting, so I'll have to let you know that in advance. Uh, the, the fact is that most Americans today have $25,000 uh, to retire on, and that's not good. 34% of us have no savings at all, not even $25,000 to retire on. 58% of us have no retirement plan of any kind. 40% don't have any idea what the words annuity or mutual funds even mean. 20% are planning to live purely on Social Security, and the government plans to take that away eventually, uh, I suspect. So where are you in all of this? Or I sh maybe should say where are we in all of this? The fact is this. Uh, I'm using California figures here just because that's uh, where the figures I had when I created this slide. And it's pretty typical across the United States. California's median income per capita is $29,000. Orange County, California, a rich county, uh, one of the richest in California, $34,000 per capita income. Los Angeles, the biggest, one of the biggest cities in, this, in the country, $27,000 is the per capita income of people living in the Los Angeles. So the fact is, as depressing as that may seem, it doesn't have to apply to you and me. We are specifically not married to any of those statistics. You and I have a thousand income producing properties waiting for us to pick them up right now for free um, within 50 miles of you. If you only knew how and where to find these properties and what to do with them once you get them. Well the fact is that we do know how to do that and we'd be just tickled to death. To One of the really nice things about this business is we're not limited in, um, in our scope. In other words by using an equity holding land trust, we can deal in single family homes. We can deal in small uh, multi family homes, uh, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, or bigger. We can deal in large uh, multi family buildings if we choose to. Single family vacation homes. 
industrial properties, retail properties of all kinds, mixed use properties, office buildings. So the idea is, let's get really serious here. We've got to determine for ourselves whether everything I'm saying to you is just a big pipe dream or whether it's, it's actually true. So ask yourself this question, should people or can people really acquire income producing real estate without a bank loan and without credit and without a down payment, without maintenance and management costs, without monthly payments, without experience, and without even having eyesight, hearing, arms, legs, or any, well, that's not true. Uh, we don't want to throw that in there. So there's a uh, hyperbole being detected there somewhere. And so I'd like you to kind of ignore that part. So the idea is, hyperbole, hyperbole. <laughs> the idea is, who is it, if, all, if what I'm telling you is true, uh, it's got to sound too good to be true. If I'm telling you, you can buy a house without a down payment, without qualifying for a loan, without having even monthly payments or costs of management and maintenance, that's got to sound too good to be true. So you got to say to yourself, is it too good to be true or is it true? Well, it's not true if you can be talked out of it. In other words, if somebody can talk you out of it, everything I said to you is untrue because you can't do it unless you do it. And who's, who have you delegated to talk you out of it? A lot of people delegate their, delegate their family and the friends to talk them out of it. They say, go ahead. I'm telling you what I'm going to do, but if you want to talk me out of it, go ahead. Well, don't do that. Don't listen to what people say. Just determine before you start off on that particular trek that you're going to do what you've decided to do because you already have the data and the information that you need. So the, the biggest um, deterrent to people's financial success is oftentimes family and friends. They mean well, uh, but they're not always giving you the best advice. Uh, they just don't want you to exceed their own expectations for financial success. And they also don't want you to make mistakes that will cost you too much money and so on. So another... Um, well, I started to say well-meaning, but these people are not well-meaning. These are the sour grapes who have uh, assumed the responsibility to denounce anything that they don't understand. If they haven't heard of it, it doesn't exist. And if they don't understand it, it's no good. And if they do understand it, the way you do it is not the way they do it. So what you're going to do is no good. And they'll figure out every way in the world to prevent you from succeeding. So you've got to be uh, on the alert and avoid those people at any cost. Now, the next group is just short-sighted people. They don't understand uh, much about commerce. They don't understand much about financing. And they also resent the idea that you would come along and want to exceed their own aspirations. I remember as a kid one time, I, I told my uh, mother, or my mother and my father at the same time, that my, my aspiration, I wanted to be able to say, I make at least six, uh, not even at least. I said, I want to make six hundred dollars a month that's what i consider successful well obviously that was a very long time ago but in about two weeks later when i was visiting my parents my mother said you know you really hurt your dad's feelings and i said what's that said, well you're telling him that you think success is six hundred dollars a month and ever since then he's been working overtime he's been doing everything he can to try to get to that number and he can't so i think maybe you ought to be careful about how you talk and what you say, you've got big ideas and so on. Well, you might consider that to be someone trying to um, sabotage my financial aspirations. Well, you know, if my parents were still living, I think they'd be proud of me to know that I've made as much as two, three, four hundred thousand dollars and a lot more in a year, uh, not just six hundred dollars a month. But the fact is, you got to be careful. Um, People resent your aspirations, and that doesn't necessarily just mean ordinary short-sighted people. That means family members and sour grapes and the whole bunch. But one of the, um, the most de detrimental groups are attorneys and realtors. Uh, and I put them in the same group because they kind of have the same mindset. The attorney goes to law school and says, you know, I spent a lot of time, and a lot of my parents at least spent a lot of money, and I spent a lot of time learning everything there is to learn. Uh, 
And when I got finished learning every single thing there was to ever know, I got my degree, I went out, I went into business. And I got a law firm, and I'm an attorney. Therefore, you're not. I am, and I know it all. And you don't, because you're not one of us. And as a result, the attorney will tell you, I've never heard of this. Uh, therefore, it doesn't exist. And if I if it did, if it had any merit or value, everyone would be doing it, and I've never heard of it at all. Therefore, it's not valid, and it's not uh, uh, even legal. Can't do it. Can't do it. There's no land trust legislation in this state. Um, there is uh, no such thing as a, a beneficiary directed inter vivos trust. Never heard of such a thing, and so on. So the the big thing about attorneys is you can never win. A debate with an attorney no matter how intelligent you are no matter how much you know you won't win because the attorney is taught that the debate is never over until the judge says so and makes a decision as to who's right so if you're trying to debate or argue with an attorney you're lost because they'll argue for 480 years it would non-stop until the jury or the judge tells them you lose and they're not about to lose, so they just will keep on arguing. They'll do everything they can to tell you that they've got something better for you that will cost you um, uh, a lot of money, but it'll be a lot safer. And don't do this. They'll do that. The realtor is the other one. The realtor doesn't spend that much time in school, uh, as far as real estate school is concerned. But they come out of real estate school figuring that they paid money and they, they spent six weeks or six months or a year in real estate school. And therefore, they should know everything there is to know. And since you're not a licensed realtor, how on earth would you know more than they do about real estate? So they're going to try to talk you out of it, too. They're going to try to, to get you to do something that can make them some money. In that regard, they're similar to attorneys. So just be careful. And, of course, competitors, people who are creative real estate financiers themselves or just real estate investors, they will, uh, if they like what they're doing and they, they've got plenty of money and plenty of credit and they're buying houses every day, they'll look down their nose at you uh, when you tell them that you're going to buy houses and not, have to need credit and not have to spend money. Well, that kind of flies in the face of reason for them because they use credit and they have a lot of money, so they spend it. You don't have to do that, but it's going to be difficult to convince them that you can do what they can do without having to go through all the pain. So here's a few of my own transactions that uh, I'll just mention. Uh, you know, they're just pictures of houses and so forth, but I just want you to see uh, that. I don't buy rundown properties. I don't buy uh, properties that need a lot of work. And I don't buy anything that's going to cost money. And I don't buy anything that's going to need credit. I just find people who have houses that don't want them. And I figure out a way to get those houses and to make money on them. And to put somebody else in the property to live there and to make payments for me. And to handle all of my repair and upkeep and uh, maintenance costs. And it, as wild as it sounds to the, to the newcomer, these properties are out there by the thousands, especially now, especially because of the foreclosure uh, phenomenon that swept the United States for the last six or seven years. They're out there, and if you know how to get around the obstacles, you've got it made. You know, an over-encumbered property doesn't have to be a problem as long as you got somebody else making the payments or as long as you have the seller making part of the payment and the buyer making the other part of the payment and you're just sitting back watching the, um, the, the, the upfront money come into your pocket and the uh, monthly cash flow come into your pocket and so on. So the idea is these are required in exactly that manner. Paso Robles Drive, Granada Hills, as you can see, that's a pretty nice house. Um, a Darrell Avenue, Northridge, about $500,000 property when I got it. When I got rid of it, it didn't cost me anything, but when I got rid of it, it was worth about three hundred dollars because of the Northridge earthquake that took down one wall and dropped a uh, fireplace chimney on a neighbor's house. And here's another one, Superior. Here's where we moved after the earthquake, Superior Street, Northridge, another really nice house. It didn't cost me anything, uh, except in this particular case, we lived there. So we had to make payments on this house of about, I don't know, 2000 a month or so, when ordinarily my next door neighbor, if they'd have bought their house at the same time that I did and put a 20% down payment and had perfect credit, they would have been paying 3000 a month.
got a good deal by taking over somebody's loan. Falcon Crest in Northridge, another property we lived in in Northridge. Uh, Galvin Heights in Riverside. Didn't live there. This is a nice income property, though, because it had two and a half acres of uh, young palm trees. And the, uh, the people that I put in the property paid a pretty good chunk to get in. And they uh, paid a, uh, about $150, $200 a month positive cash flow. And they were there for a period of a couple of years. And I got the property at 90000 and sold it for about 180000 I think it was. And so we did okay on that without any credit and without any bank qualifying or anything. Here's Crestline Drive in Woodland Hills, California. We got in at this property at 500000 and uh, refinanced it at about 900000 and took in four hundred and gave half of it to the lady who made the upfront money for us. In other words, when I found this house, it, the uh, upfront money it was in arrears and uh, the seller on this property said I could have it take over everything as long as I came in with, I think it was thirty or $40,000. So as a result, um, I got a, an investor uh, to partner with me 50-50 on an equity share basis. I moved in, made the payments, and the investor put in the money that we needed up front. And then a couple of years later, refinanced and uh, pulled out 400000 I think it was uh, pulled out 600000 I believe it was. I gave her three. No, that's not right. Pulled out 300000 I gave her one fifty. We ended up with one fifty. And uh, that's kind of a nice way to do business. So there's the property. And you're going to see a gigantic difference now. Okay, watch this. $30,000. And it went from there to there. Uh, well, you see the awnings? <laughs> that's about it. We put in some new uh, wrought iron, uh, the white wrought iron instead of wood, and put up some awnings. And that was about it. So uh, it was a nice profit. A property that I hope I never see again the rest of my life. Uh, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. This is the uh, property that we got. We could have had it at 100, and I believe it was 190 thousand at the time we took it. It was worth about 220, but the seller couldn't sell it, and he was happy to let me just take over the payments. But unfortunately, this was one transaction that uh, fell apart. We did a non-exclusive option on this. In other words, I took it for a 45-day uh, non-exclusive option, which means that. He had the right to terminate the option anytime he wanted to if he found somebody who would give him a better price than I was offering. But he had, with the non exclusive option, he had to give me five days to perform. And if I wanted the house badly enough, I'd have just gone ahead and taken it within that five days. But when he decided he had uh, found out he had a terminal disease uh, or illness and he just wanted to cancel the deal, I said, okay. I'd already spent $5,000 on repairing some plumbing. But under the circumstances, I just said, okay, we'll go ahead and cancel it. Then I'm sure I'll get rewarded in karma or something for being a nice guy. Here's one uh, that uh, Lolo Canyon Boulevard. Uh, we still have this property, and our uh, former attorney is living there. And uh, we got that, I uh, believe it was 260 refinanced it at about 600 pulled out some cash. And um, bear, bear in mind, this is uh, you know kind of a nice way to buy real estate. No money out of pocket, no down payment, no uh, closing costs, no loan, nothing. Our attorney gave us plenty of money to move in and live there, even though he defaulted in his rent several times. And uh, haven't seen him in a while, so I hope he's still making his payments. Now here are a couple more properties just to glance at and the numbers you see folded in there. Those are, you know, examples of some of the profit. Now bear in mind that a lot of the profit that I talk about wasn't necessarily all ours. In other words, many of these we had other partners. We had uh, equity shares. We had um, uh, cash investors come in with us and we had uh, uh, people partner with us who didn't have any cash but they were willing to do the work for us in order to make the house more saleable and what have you. But these properties are properties that required nothing down, nothing a month, nothing uh, ventured, nothing lost and so on. So again we got to ask our question, you know, is this really true? Is it safe? Is it legal? Is it risky? Is it fair to everybody? Is it profitable? Do we have to have help to do it? At least in the beginning, I'd say yes. Uh, as far as the, the other questions, I would say yes. To, it's safe. It's legal. Uh, is it risky? 
Yes. Is it fair? Yes. Is it profitable? Yes. Do you need help in doing it? I would think so. Unless you're already familiar with the third-party title holding Illinois type inter vivos uh, living land trust. <laughs> I would think you might need some help in the beginning, but that's what we're there for. So innovative creative uh, real estate. It, it takes many forms. Now, if we're talking about creative real estate in general, which is the standard word for seller-assisted financing in various forms, um, it takes many forms. I mean, you've heard them all, and you've probably done some of them, if not all of them. The lease option, that's just a form of creative real estate. Somebody wants to have all the benefits of ownership, maybe without the tax write-off, but they'd like to know that they can have a right to buy the house at some point in the future at a discounted price and maybe have some of the rent apply to the purchase price and so on. So a lease option seems like a logical alternative to buying a house, especially when you don't have a down payment or can't qualify for a loan. Then you have the wraparound mortgage or the all-inclusive trustee or the all-inclusive mortgage, which is basically just seller financing. The seller makes you a loan. You want to buy the house, uh, and the seller makes you a loan that's bigger than the loan that he already has on the house. So when you make your payment to the seller, he makes his payment to the mortgage, uh, to the to the mortgagee, and uh, whatever's left over, he puts in his pocket as his profit on the transaction every month. Contract for deed. Contract for deed uh, is merely a layaway plan on a house. You come in and you say, okay, I want, I would like to have the deed after I get the house paid for. So the person puts you in. He's called the vendor. You're called the vendee. You go into the house and live there until you get it paid for, one way or the other, and then you get the deed. But up until that time, you're not going to have the deed to the property. You don't own it. You're you're merely a vendee in this particular case, and you have no ownership, and as a result, you have no income tax write-off unless you write the transaction as a contract of sale rather than a contract for deed. So if you write it as a contract of sale, well, then automatically you're back to the same situation and having violated the lender's due on sale clause, subjecting all parties to each other's liens and suits and judgments and, and subjecting the house to liens and IRS claims and all, all kinds of things. So there's a, a, a dozen um, disadvantages to doing any one of these things. Even the lease option violates a due on sale clause, no tax write-off. Wraparound mortgage contract for deed, all the same disadvantages. Then we have the uh, the uh, creative financing arrangement called the equity share. Well, the equity share is the, my favorite thing in the world. I don't do it uh, with a deed, but I love the equity share because the equity share gives me the the opportunity to make a nice monthly positive cash flow where I might not otherwise, and it also can give me appreciation insurance. I can make money on a property even if the value goes down uh, because of uh, the extra monthly payments that I can get on an equity share. So, simplistically uh, speaking, the equity share is a an acquisition arrangement where one party makes the down payment or has already made the down payment and the other party comes in and makes the monthly payments and then the parties usually will agree at the end that they're going to share the profits 50-50 between them. Now they come in on title 50-50 undivided half interest as tenants in common and then the, the resident party, the resident uh, acquiring party, makes the payments, covers the taxes, insurance, and upkeep and repairs, and at the end they just sell the property and split the profit. Now that's a wonderful idea, other than the fact that the equity share is a direct violation of lender's due on sale clause, and the property could be foreclosed on any minute without notice if they find out about it, if they want to. And also, uh, the equity share got a lot of problems with income tax right now because there's uh, Section uh, 280 in the Internal Revenue Code. It's very unclear, and it's, uh, it's unclear as to whether the resident party can take more than 50% of the tax right now, and the resident party, unless he occupies the property uh, for a certain number of months a year, doesn't get any tax right now. And anybody's liens and suits and judgments and dollar actions and marital disputes and bankruptcies and IRS claims and so forth will attach directly to the property, thereby very negatively affecting the other party who didn't do anything wrong. So the equity share in its former form is not advisable. 
However, any one of these things, uh, as far as the function is concerned, is very advisable as long as you're not dealing with the title to the property. It's much, much safer, simpler, and uh, legally pure to uh, deal with the beneficiary interest in a trust that owns the property rather than dealing with title to the property. So the next thing you have then is us. That's the title holding trust transfer. Property goes into a title holding trust and then somebody can give away or assign or sell any percentage of the beneficial interest they want to. It can do 50% and then it's an equity share. It could do 80% with an agreement to give the other 20% to them later on. Then it's a contract for deed. They can give them 90% today with an agreement to give them the other 10% uh, at the end of the trust. And now it's the same as a, a wraparound. And all of these things can be accomplished without having to violate a due on sale clause, without jeopardizing the property and the parties to liens and lawsuits and judgments and so on. So it's, uh, it's something you really, really need to understand if you're interested in doing creative real estate safely, honestly, ethically, and legally, and so on. Now, obviously, somebody can put their own house in a trust, for and which any everybody should. If you own real estate of any kind, it doesn't matter whether it's a house or an industrial building or a bunch of farmland, it should be in a land trust so that everybody in the world and their uncle and attorney can't see that you own it. And as a result, they're not going to just jump up and sue you because they know that you have real estate and that you'll buckle under pressure and pay them money even though you're not at fault in the lawsuit, you'll let them extort you because you don't want to lose your real estate. So it's a good idea to hide that real estate from public view and make somebody really, really work hard to find out uh, who owns the house and then work really, really hard to find out who the beneficiary of that trust is and then work even harder to find out, uh, unfortunately, that they can't uh, put a lien against the property because you don't own it. The trust does. After all that work, they find out you're not the owner. They can't come to that and get that. They can sue you, but they can't get to the property in the process. And then, of course, there's a lease purchase arrangement. A lot of people think a lease option and a lease purchase means the same thing. It doesn't. A lease option is a unilateral contract. Only one party needs to perform. That's the, the, uh, the lessor. And the other party, the, the lessee, and a lease, lease option doesn't have to perform. You can walk away at the end of the agreement, and it's called an executory contract uh, because of that. And executory contracts in some states, Texas for sure, and, and possibly Maryland, and soon to be um, Illinois, executory contracts uh, like land, or excuse me, uh, like uh, land sale contracts and lease options are illegal. But if somebody in Texas, let's say, where we know that executory contracts are illegal, want to accomplish exactly the same end result and the same objective, they can do the same thing without there being an option or a land sale contract by merely dealing with the beneficial interest in the trust rather than the title to the property. So a lease purchase differs from a lease option in that a lease purchase is a bilateral contract. A lease purchase means that there's a contingency sale waiting to happen. The buyer promises to buy at a certain point in time. The seller promises to sell at a certain point in time. And as a result, uh, a lease purchase uh, qualifies under IRC 163 uh, uh, to give the, uh, the purchasing party uh, income tax write-off during the course of the transaction. And um, that you can see that in a case called Belden versus the United States Tax Court, uh, and so on. So those are the options that you have if you're going to be doing. So what we want to do is just to say that you don't, you don't need that. Uh, there's a better way to do all of these things. Once again, here's a lease option. It says, give me, you know, the, the seller or the option or says, give me some money up front, and we'll call it an option fee, and then pay something every month, and we'll call it a rent credit. And it pay something in addition to the regular lease payment, call it a rent credit, and then we'll give you some or all of that back at the end when you finally buy the property.
So the disadvantages are no income tax write-off benefits are available. There's no guarantee of eventual ownership because the optioner can just walk away. It'll cost you a lot more to sue them than you could make by winning the lawsuit. And they walk away very, very frequently. Uh, the underlying loans due on sale clause is violated. Either party's credit or judgments can attach to the option and to or to the property. And most it, it is singularly the most litigious of all creative financing schemes out there. That's why Texas and various other states are are ruling them essentially illegal. In other words, in Texas you could do it, but you have to be able to transfer full title ownership within six months. The other one, the contract for deed, the same kind of negatives. And the contract for deed, like we said, it's a it's a layaway plan. The the vendor, who otherwise would be the seller, agrees to leave his financing in place for a while until the buyer, or called the vendee in this case, because he's not buying something, agrees to refinance the property in his own name and then get ownership at that time. Uh, vendee makes payments to the vendor, and then the vendor makes payments to the bank, and um, this goes on for a number of years until the underlying financing is finally retired and the deed transferred. The wraparound mortgage. In a wraparound, it's just merely like we said, a situation where a seller um, sells the, uh, the property by making a loan to his buyer to be able to buy the property from him. So he makes a, uh, there's $80,000 owed on the house, so he makes a loan to his buyer for $100,000. And when he gets the payment in, he sends the payment for the 80 to the bank. And then the rest of the payment goes for that 20,000 equity that he's carrying, and he sticks that in his pocket. And uh, there are various reasons for a wraparound. Uh, a wraparound makes you more money than trying to carry a second. You put a second mortgage on the house and tell the, uh, the borrower that he's going to have to pay 20% interest on a second mortgage, he's going to walk away. But you can make the same amount of interest by making him a $100,000 loan instead of a $20,000 second and charging 4 or 5% interest. And all of a sudden, you're making your 20% interest anyway, but it sounds like a small amount of money. Uh, it's typically done in order to facilitate a buyer's acquisition of the home while maximizing the sub return on investment. And then again, we've got the equity share. And, and bear in mind, virtually every property that I showed you that I've acquired over the years has been an equity share. An equity share is where two or more parties take title to the property, agreeing that they're going to share its proceeds on sale or other disposition or share, share the proceeds of a refinance and so on. So in a typical equity share, one party qualifies for the loan and makes the down payment, or he already has the loan and has already made the down payment, while another, one, another party lives in the property and covers the costs, including upkeep and repairs and so on. So let's talk a minute about um, equity sharing and show you why I think it's the best way to go. Now, bear in mind that when I'm doing equity sharing, I'm not putting two people on the same title, 50-50, undivided, half interest, tenants in common, and all that, because they know better. What I do is I put the property in a title holding land trust, and then I uh, will put a resident beneficiary in the title holding land trust who's going to live in the property, make the payments, handle the upkeep and repairs for me, and um, I'll give them 50% of the beneficial interest rather than 50% title ownership. They get all exactly the same benefits plus some beautiful asset protection in the process. So let's take a $200,000 house that's being rented out. So let's presume that the monthly payments on this $200,000 house and maybe $180,000 owed on it be about $1,400 a month. The maintenance cost on a property, you're going to have to budget in 1% to 1.5% uh, per year. Now that depends on whether it's a new house or an older house. The older the house is, the higher the budget factor has to be. Um, but let's just presume that in this particular case, the maintenance budget is going to be $167 a month. Vacancy factor. You got to calculate vacancies at, a, at around two payments at least a year that you're not going to get from a tenant that you might have to make to the bank. So you're going to have to calculate $267 a month into your vacancy factor. And that will then bring your total uh, budget in this, the, uh, in this house up to $1,834 a month. However, Let's say that the rental on this property, 0.8% of the property's value usually on a, on a property this, this, of this size, and that's high, 
uh, probably 0.7 might be better, but let's say you could get 8, uh, 0.8. In that case, you could rent this $200,000 house out for $1,600 a month. Well, that's great, except that it leaves you $234 a month upside down. Well, that's probably not terrible if you can afford it because you know the house is going to go up in value. You know the loan is going to be reduced over a period of time. So maybe you can absorb that for a while. And if you can just count on, which, you know, we haven't been able to for a while now, but we used to be able to count on, say, 5% a year in appreciation. And again, forget the Midwest. Forget uh, San Antonio, Texas. Forget some of these places where you just see a real stable market, not a lot of depreciation, not a lot of appreciation. Let's just say the bigger cities, 5% a year for five years, you would make $55,000 plus in appreciation. Now, that's wonderful. And then uh, this means then that your 234 uh, a month over 60 months would come up to a loss of $14,000 off of the 55. So you got to figure out a way, maybe you can make up that loss. So you're going to uh, you know you're going to reduce the principal over that period of time in the mortgage loan by 62.51, and more than likely you can increase the rents as you go along. And let's say you just want to cover the fourteen thousand forty dollars loss, so you increase the rents over that period of time to compensate for about seventy seven hundred eighty nine dollars. Now what that means then is at the end of the five years, if You've seen that kind of appreciation, which is small amount in a good market, but a large amount in a bad market. But if, if it's a good market, you're going to see $55,256 profit on that deal. Okay, now let's take the same property and let, now let's do it as an equity share. In other words, let's make it cheaper for the, the resident and more profitable for yourself with an insurance policy built in, uh, appreciation insurance. Let me show you why. First of all, your monthly payment, remember, is uh, $1,400 a month. That's the same same house, same mortgage, same same payment, $1,400 a month PITI. Now, what are your maintenance costs going to be when your resident beneficiary has agreed to cover all the costs? Zero. What are your vacancies going to be when you have a five-year agreement with this resident beneficiary? Zero. So now what's your total expense budget? Total expense budget now is $1,400. Now, what is your rental income from this property? Remember before we said you could rent it for $1,600 a month, maybe, on the good side. However, think about this. How much could you rent it for if you can give your resident tenant, your tenant buyer, your resident beneficiary, if you can give them full income tax write-off for mortgage uh, interest and property tax? Well, obviously, if otherwise they would pay $1,600 a month to rent, they wouldn't get any tax benefit. So when they earn the $1,600, the government's going to take another $800. Okay? Half of their rent goes to the government for income taxes. Now, why is that? Well, somebody in that size house is probably going to be in a one-third tax bracket. That means they have to make their rent, which is $1,600, and that has to count for two-thirds of their, their cost. And the other third, which would be $800, means now that they would be paying equivalent to $2,400 a month to rent that house. So somebody renting for $1,600, if they're going to go, they have to go out and earn $2,400, so the government can take one-third of the twenty-four and leave them with sixteen to give the landlord. Well, how about this? How about giving the tenant the income tax write-off on your mortgage loan? If it's possible to do that, wouldn't that be great? Because now you could rent the property out for $2,400 a month instead of $1,600 a month, and they would be paying exactly the same amount. Well, let's be really nice to them. Let's not charge them $2,400 a month. Let's only charge them $1,950 a month. Now, that means now that what's happening is you're getting part of that that $800 a month that they don't have to pay to the government, and they're getting part of that $800 a month they don't have to pay to the government. So as a result, their, your own net rental income turns out to be $550 a month. But unfortunately, since this is a 50-50 equity share, the gain that you get on that $55,000 in appreciation is only half of it. So your appreciation is going to be $27,628. 
over the same period of time. You only get half the appreciation. They get the other half. Now, your monthly in that gain now at the five fifty a month times 60, that comes out to $33,000 in additional income that you've gotten. Now, the principal reduction over that period of time, and the principal reduction in the mortgage loan, it's only going to be half of the sixty-two fifty you had before. Now you're only going to get thirty-one twenty-five. And as far as the rental increases, you're not going to increase the rent more than likely because you've got a contract for five years that says the monthly payment is going to be X amount and that's it. So there's no rental periodic rental increases to buffer anything. But look at what happens here. It's your net gain. Instead of fifty-five thousand dollars. You made almost $64,000, and you never had to lift a finger or pick up a hammer or a screwdriver or a skill saw or whatever else it takes to fix things when they break. You never had to stick your own broom down, bound the garbage disposal to dislodge the peach pits that they threw in there because they're only renting. So here's the deal now for a second. What if there is no appreciation, zero appreciation? Well, all of a sudden now, you don't get any of that. So if you look down below here, you see zero appreciation. Your monthly net gain, though, is still $14,000. And all of a sudden, your principal reduction is $62,551. Or your periodic uh, rent increases uh, $77,89. And as a result, you've got zero appreciation, zero profit. Not a good thing. I mean, if the house doesn't go up in value, you, you don't get anything. You've lost it all. But let's take a look at the equity share when there's no appreciation. First of all, mortgage payments $1,400 a month, no maintenance cost, no vacancy cost, no, your expense budget is now $1,400 a month, your monthly rental income is $1,950, net rental income $550, gain on appreciation, zero. Monthly net gain thirty three thousand dollars. Principal reduction thirty one twenty five. Periodic rent increases zero. But look at your five year net gain thirty three thousand dollars. Now wouldn't you say that thirty three thousand one hundred twenty five dollars on this house that did not appreciate a single penny is better than the zero that you would have gotten if you'd have just been renting it out? That's why I love equity sharing. That $33,000 turns out to be appreciation insurance. What if this house had gone down in value, down to zero, and you just had to walk away? Well, you still made $33,125. That's why I love the equity sharing concept. But I love the concept when it's coupled with a title holding land trust, whereby I give the resident beneficiary 50% of the uh, beneficial interest in the trust and agree that we will share profit proportionally with whatever percentage of the trust that we own. Now, what about all of this? Speaking of uh, innovative real estate, are there downsides? Well, obviously, there are plenty of downsides. But what we want to do is to eliminate them. So how are we going to eliminate them? Well, we use the chameleon-like uh, land, uh, title holding land trust that can become anything you want it to be. You don't have to deal with the deed and run afoul of the law and take all kinds of legal risk and create all kinds of exposure and so on. You just don't have to do it because you can set up the same exact advantages and benefits and features and so on of any innovative real estate scheme that you can think of. You can accomplish them with the equity holding trust transfer. So here's how trust works. First of all, I want to tell you what a trust is. Uh, and most people hear things like, oh, uh, um, what's his name? Bill Gates uh, is, got a big trust, and the government is trying to bust his trust and so forth. And then there's some millionaire guy who set up a charitable remainder trust to, to uh, benefit Pepperdine Law School. And, and somebody else did this $400 billion, trillion dollar, uh, trust to benefit public radio. What is a trust anyway? Well, if it sounds complicated, let me tell you something. It's not. If I hand you my fountain pen and ask you to hold it for me until I get out of the swimming pool, and then I come back and take the fountain pen back and stick it in my shorts or whatever I happen to be <laughs> wearing when I come out of the swimming pool, we just created a trust. I said to you, I trust you to hold this fountain pen for me. 
But if I need it, I want you to hand it to me so I can write my girlfriend a letter. Uh, and when I get out of the swimming pool, I'd like to revoke that trust and take my fountain pen back. We've just created a fully viable, valid trust, and that's all it is. It's, it's a transaction, or maybe it better said a, a set of documents. It's basically an arrangement directing a trusted third party to own something for the benefit of someone else. A set of documents providing for alternate or secret ownership of an item by one party for the benefit of another party, whereby the item's ownership and its use are separate. In other words, in the United States, <clears throat> with the exception of Louisiana, Tennessee, and possibly Washington State, we're not sure about Washington yet, but there's a, a specific laws called use in land and use in law, and the two are not the same. So in Louisiana, Tennessee, use in land and, and, and use in real estate are the same thing. In other words, in those states, land trust isn't seen as anything special. It's just a simple um, inter vivos trust. It doesn't convey any particular rights that any inter vivos trust would and so on. But in the other states where you separate out the use of an asset from the ownership, now we're dealing with use in trust rather than use in land. Okay, and that makes wonderful uh, uh, makes it a wonderful opportunity for us because we're in the business that really needs a sort of an, an advantage. So let's talk just a little bit about something that some things that you can do that nobody else can do. Let's talk about finding some big chunks of gold where your competition, your adversaries, are not looking. They don't even know that it's there. Let me show you this. Doing for a little while what other people are unwilling to do means being able to charge those other people for a lifetime for what they are unable to do. Now take that very seriously because that is the key to riches. Uh, anytime you can do something other people can't do and they need you to do it for them, you make money. Ask a, uh, ask a doctor, and a lawyer, a, a psychiatrist, a rocket engineer if that's not the truth. Ask a heroin addict if that's not the truth. If you know where to get it and the other people don't, you got a built-in market. Well, I don't want to deal in heroin, <laughs> but I would like to deal in uh, the knowledge base of the title-holding Illinois-type beneficiary-directed third-party trustee Illinois land trust every day. That's the money and that's the money that can fill your pocket up quicker than you ever could. Let's talk now about the reason that this can put money in your property. Let's talk about dealing with over encumbered properties. Now how many people do you know who love to go out and buy real estate for more than it's worth other than me? I don't care what it's worth. All I care about is can I make any money on it? Give me a million dollar house that uh, got a two million dollar loan on it, I'll take it if I can make a positive cash flow on it and if I can get somebody to give me uh, 30, 40,000 up front to be able to live in this beautiful home, I don't care if it's over encumbered as long as I'm not the one that has to pay off the over encumbrance. Maybe I'll just take it and uh, let the seller pay uh, most all the payment. I'll just put it in a uh, land trust and uh, bring in a resident beneficiary for enough money to put some of it in my pocket and then charge them $40,000 up front for the privilege of living in a house that used to be worth $250,000. So that's the deal. So let's talk about how you can make money without having to deal with this concept of equity. First of all, equity is a wonderful thing, but we do not need to have it in order to make money. How much equity do you have in IBM stock the day you buy it? IBM stock going up. I don't know if IBM stock's going up, but Google is. How much equity do you have in your Google stock the day that you buy your stock certificates? You don't have any equity, and you don't want any equity. I mean, you'd love to have it, but you know you're not going to get it, but the Google stock's going to be great anyway because you know or you feel confident that that stock is going to go up in value. So that's what you're buying is future appreciation, and future appreciation is always valuable. And that's all you have if you buy Google stock or Yahoo stock. Anything else is the potential for future appreciation. But what if you got a lot more profit centers than that? What if you could do with Google stock or Yahoo stock or IBM stock 
what we can do with real estate. We don't need any beginning equity in order to make money because we can make money from bumped equity. In other words, we can say the house is only worth $200,000 now, but I'm going to put it in this a deal of ours at $220,000. Is that okay with you since you don't have any credit and you don't have any real money up front and so on? Yeah, sure, that's okay. As long as I get to live in a really, really nice house and as long as I can afford the payments, great. Well, when we come out of this deal, I'm not going to make any money on it today, but when we come out of this deal and the profits are being divided up, I'm going to get an extra $20,000 because I bumped the equity to take place in five years from now or 10 or 20 or two. So bumped equity is a wonderful way to make money. What about upfront cash from a buyer? You suppose if I've got a house that's worth $200,000 as a $220,000 loan on it, that and a buyer is willing to come in and make affordable payments, and he's got planning to live there for 20 years or, or more, do you suppose he's going to have a problem paying me a whole lot less than he would ever pay for a down payment? Down payment on a $200,000 house gets an 80% loan, it's going to be $40,000. Well, what if I'm only going to charge him $8,000? Well, guess where that $8,000 goes? It goes into my pocket. How much did I pay for the house? Nothing. How much loan qualifying did I have to do? Nothing. How much credit did I have to have? Nothing. But he gave me $8,000. Now, remember, this property is $20,000 over encumbered. Now, is that seller going to be able to... Uh, give me some money up front to take this off his hands. He already tried to sell it through a real estate agent. He told the real estate agent, hey, listen, I'll have to pay off that 20000 over encumbrance to the bank, and then I'm going to have to pay you a 6% commission. And if I pay you a 6% commission, I'm into this thing close to 20000 bucks. Oh, my God, I hope you can sell it for full market value. And the agent says, well, we'll get at least 90% of full market value. Oh, my God, now I'm in at 30000 bucks. Do you suppose if I tell the seller I'll take it as is, and that he doesn't have to come up with any more than just $10,000, that he might be willing to pay me ten, five, dollars just to take it off his hands. And when I point out to him that the payments are way too high, but I can reduce those, then all he'd have to do is pay some small part of the monthly payment, maybe the, the property tax. Do you suppose he'd be willing to do that, to get out from under that over-encumbered, burdensome property? Of course he would. So I can get money from the buyer up front. I get money from a seller up front. You suppose I might bring you in as my partner and say, give me $4,000 and I'll make you a partner in this deal with me. And you give me some money up front. Now I've made money up front from the buyer, the seller, and you. And I'm doing pretty good and I still haven't spent any money. And I haven't qualified for any loans and so on. And I'm going to get some percentage of the profit Someday, when that property sells, if it appreciates at all, I'm going to get something, but I'm going to have money up front, and we're going to set it up so when the seller makes his monthly payment, it's going to be a little bit more than the property tax, and when the buyer makes his monthly payment, maybe $100, $200 more than what would ordinarily be his payment, so I'm going to make some positive cash flow along the way, and I'm going to make some money at the end, and you're going to make some money at the end. And maybe I'll share some of the positive cash flow with you, too. I might even share some of the uh, the uh, seller's upfront money with you and so on. So cash from the buyer, cash from the seller, cash from the investor. What do I care whether the house has any equity in it or not? Makes no difference to me because I've got other profits in it. How about this one? Well, we already talked about positive cash flow, but obviously that's another profit center. Principal reduction. Okay, well, that $20,000 over encumbrance is not going to allow any principal reduction for a while. But what if the market shoots up in the next year and a half or two years, which I think it will, if not sooner, shoots up. And all of a sudden, it's not $20,000 over encumbered. Now it's uh, got $10,000 equity. Well, I put the uh, mutually agreed value at uh, 220 and we are now only owe 190 So that gives me $30,000 head start right away just on principal reduction. What about this one? The sale of the income tax write-off. My resident beneficiary comes along, and I essentially, notes the quotation marks, I sell him the income tax write-off by saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give the income tax write-off, and I'm going to charge you X number of dollars of rent, which would be higher than normal rent, but it's going to save him a lot of money because he has the tax write-off. Uh, so he's not going to mind one single bit about that. So I'm going to make some money on, quote-unquote, selling the tax write-off. 
And again, if the property appreciates at all, I'm going to make money there. And what if I don't do any of that? What if I just put this deal together, this dream deal together, and then I put an ad on Craigslist that says, here's a dream deal. How would you like to have a house with no payments, with a $200 a month positive cash flow, with potential for future appreciation and equity buildup, and only $10,000 cash takes it all? I mean, that just might put some money in my pocket. So guys, you know, whatever we're talking about here, take it seriously, because this is your financial future. Think about this really, really hard. If someone were to step up today and give you the inside scoop on where and exactly how you can pick up $1 million in management and payment-free real estate, what would you do to beg, borrow, or steal, say, 5000 bucks to take it off their hand? Wouldn't you do everything in your power? And don't you think you could scrape up 5000 bucks to get a $1 million in management-free real estate? Of course you would. There's no doubt about that. You can go rob a train to get it. I mean, whatever it took. I think trains are easier than liquor stores. I found that out the hard way. So the answer to that is, hell yeah, man. You bet I would. In a, in a heartbeat. So let's look at this one now. Here's another question. When somebody tells you that they can't afford something, something that they really want, what does that virtually always mean? It means they don't need it. Because if you need it, you're going to get it. How many heroin addicts do you know who can afford heroin? They can't, but they really need it, so they don't do without it. And that's the same with anybody. Somebody wants a, they're longing their entire life, and they want a 30-foot sailing sloop. And it's just out of their budget, but they're dying for it, and they pray for it, and they, they think about it, and they put it in their, their wish list, and they post it on the, the dashboard of their car. They're going to end up with it because as soon as they can convert their wanting to needing, then it just happens. I mean, it's just the way it is. Take a look around you. Everything that you can see or touch right now or could see or touch if you went to where it is, is something that you needed. Whether it's a sheet of paper or whether it's a house, you have it because you needed it. But there are a lot of things that you don't have because you don't need them. If you needed them, you'd have them. If it was just a want or a wish or a hope or a prayer, chances are you don't have it. Because if you had it, you wouldn't have to pray for it. So understand this. Needs are always fulfilled. Wants, wishes, hopes, and dreams never are. They, you can accidentally fall into one. But believe me, if you don't need it, you won't keep it. Wanting something has never, ever brought anything of value into existence until the need for it was established. One more question. When somebody admires or fawns over your new car, but says, that, oh my God, I just love it. It's so great, great, great. But I really wouldn't want one like it. What does that mean? That just means they're making excuses for presuming that they can't afford it. If they wanted it, if it became the same need to them that it was to you, they could afford it. They'd find a way to afford it because when you convert it to a need, it comes into life. You can't stop it. I know this sounds new agey and uh, new religioso and all that kind of stuff, but guys, please don't take it that way. It's not. What I'm giving you right now is simple, absolute, total fact. And it's not some new age religious concept. It really is true. What does the expression, I can't afford it, always mean? It means every single time someone says it, I don't want it, I, I don't desire it enough to let go of some self-serving need that is feeding on my deficiency. The self-serving need that I insist on catering to that keeps me from having the things that I wish for but never get. Sleep that night. What happens if you're in college and you you'd like to sleep late, but you're in college, you've got your finals coming up tomorrow. You're going to go to bed early or you're going to try to keep yourself awake as long as you can. You know that the reward comes from getting more relax, uh, relaxation and sleep before the final exam for most people. There are people who might thrive on it. Uh, avoiding uh, time-consuming exercise. That's an obvious one. You know what happens if you... Um, take some time to do exercise. All of a sudden, miraculously, you have more time to do everything else. It's amazing. You take an hour of exercise 
and all of a sudden you got an extra two hours in the day for some reason. I don't know where that comes from, but it does. And believe me, I'm one who has to do a lot more of that. Reading. Well, we can talk about overeating. We don't have to. Pretty obvious. If you're an overeater, stop overeating. You, you, and you say, oh, I'm an overeater. I'm a fat guy. So, uh, but I want to be thin because I can get the girls if I'm thin. I'm really good looking under all this uh, adipose tissue. You, you get some of this adipose tissue off my face, you're going to find pretty stuff there. Well, you, you get the girl if you get rid of the adipose tissue. And then after you get the girl, do what I did. Then get fat again. I'm just kidding. Well, maybe I'm not, come to think of it. I need to lose 20 pounds, though. Help me out. Okay, I need to lose 20 pounds. All right, guys, here's the deal. I want to ask you this, and please take these questions as seriously as you may have some of the others. How much is your family's financial future really worth to you? If I'm going to be your coach, I'm going to do my ultimate best to bring your financial future into reality with you, for you, and so on. And I'm not cheap. Well, I'm less expensive than most, but I'm certainly, the amount that I charge for coaching is an amount of money that if somebody came to me today and said, hey, give it to me, loan it to me for a week, I might be real hesitant about giving them that much money. However, you're going to find out that what I do is very reasonably priced relative to what other people charge for inferior service. So how much is your family's future worth? How much would you pay a real mentor uh, if he could or she could double, triple, or quadruple your best year's income every year for the rest of your life? How much would you pay to have a guaranteed college education for your kids or an expensive wedding for your daughter or a Maserati for yourself? If it was you needed, would owning your own home plus picking up a few income properties without any cash or credit be worth what a good coach might charge you to work with you and show you how to do these things? Well, please, here's the solution. Here is how you bring that want or that wish or that hope or that dream into existence. Join us. Join the team. You know, I, I want to be your personal coach and mentor. Uh, I want to do one-on-one -on -one with you as often as you want to. But I also want to do group sessions every uh, week, at least once a week. We right now are doing Saturday sessions. They run about an hour to hour and a half. And every other week or so, we'll do a, a three-hour webinar. Training is the key to our business. In other words, training you to be successful is what brings other people in who want to emulate your success. And as a result, we are steeped in training and education. And uh, if you could become a part of the Open Door Wealth Management National Marketing Affiliate Network, I think you could do pretty well with us because here's what we do with the affiliate network. Commissioned licensing right to all of our products. In other words, if you're an affiliate of our company, you can go out and sell the same products that I sell, the same training programs, the same seminars and webinars and books and tapes and whatever it is, or any product or service that we have available, we will pay you commissions for, for doing that. In other words, we share profits with you. Your own replicated website in order to do just that. In other words, we will create the website for you, actually two of them, uh, two replicated website. One of them is for customer service and the other is for promoting the products uh, so you can make money on selling what we sell. And then also we're going to provide you with uh, regular documentation and selling tools revisions. Um, and we have a lot of that what we revise on a regular basis. One-on-one -on -one lifetime. That's lifetime. Yours, not mine. Uh, mentor, fortunately. Uh, <laughs> mentoring and sales training. <clears throat> uh, Bi-weekly teleconference uh, investor training. ODM uh, and ODM uh, by, I'm sure you know it by this time, stands for Open Door Wealth Management. But the ODM Quick Start Success Pack with all of the books, recording, sales aids, and so forth. Did I say eggs? Sales aids and so forth. Uh, the full documentation manual, which is under continual revision. The members only access to the national membership roster, thousands of like-minded network members across. 
open uh, communications between you and our office and your prospects uh, for questions and answers and for closing transactions and so on. Anytime we're asked if you want us to close a transaction for you, uh, I'm a pretty good closer and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you on a three-way call with your clients anytime you want to. Uh, we're going to give you a discount on all of our uh, documentation, facilitation fees, trust setup fees, and acceptance fees, and so on, at least 65%. Now, that means that the, the, the fee that you would charge for the services would be the full amount. We give you 65% discount, and you would just keep the difference for yourself. That would be your commission for those kinds of things. The book, A Fortune in Free Real Estate, uh, fourth edition, currently in process. A book, Making It Big and Keeping It This Time, uh, so that covers, it's kind of a mini course, it covers selling skills, motivation, creating a business plan, uh, dealing with buyers, sellers, and attorneys, and so on. And then uh, free attendance, we, uh, if you're one of us, obviously you don't attend, you don't pay any money to attend our workshops and seminars. When you get there, we might ask for your help once in a while, but that'd be up to you. Uh, you want to sit at the desk and check people in or uh, help us with the camera if we're recording something. Uh, free legal and accounting assistance by our own in-house counsel, Maurice Kempner and uh, uh, Minuteman um, um, Legal Services and also Minuteman, excuse me. Minuteman Accounting Services and also Maurice Kempner and Associates Legal Services. Weekly telecoaching recording archives. Uh, we go back five years. Very few people go back that far, but you can always go back, um, you know, and pick up a recording that uh, a Saturday session that you might have missed. There's a 100% money back lifetime success guarantee with our um, uh, OCS program. OCS stands for our commitment to your success. In other words, you either succeed with us or you get 100% of your money back, full refund after any year that you're with us, or you um, didn't make at least 10 times the cost of your materials and everything else. Now, we know that's not going to happen because if you don't do what we ask you to on a consistent basis, then we'll drop you and have you wait six months to join again. And when you join again after six months of being dropped, you get another lifetime guarantee. So either you do what we ask you to and you get rich, or you don't do what we ask you to and you get dropped. So either way, you've got a guarantee, but you're part of the guarantee. Um, <clears throat> we'll handle and review the paperwork for you. All of your proposals, offers, counter offers, and non-exclusive options. We'll take a look to, to see that you did it all correctly and so on. And then in the process, there's a Kind of a minor issue, but there's a tabletop uh, printed booklet presentation, synchronized audio, video track. Uh, uh, the, the Kickstart workshop is recorded for you. That's a seminar that we did, two and a half day workshop in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, but it's still current. Uh, full documentation manual, including all the documents we use, do it yourself. Uh, Web based uh, setup service. Uh, so, as far as the, um, the affiliate program is concerned, just know that uh, we're tops in coaching, mentoring, marketing, buy, sell, partnering, and that's what we do. Now, if you'd have joined us uh, a couple of years back, you'd have paid $8,000, and hundreds of people did over a period of time, and actually thousands over the last 20 years, but you don't have to pay $8,000. What we did is we reduced that price down to $69.97. $7,000. Well, uh, good news again, you don't have to pay that either. We then reduced the price uh, for full affiliate membership to $2,997, believe it or not. But it's not that much either. <laughs> so the last reduction that we did, and the lowest we can go, as they say, is $2,197 and $49 a month and for as long as you want to remain in the program. And, and remaining in the program means that we're going to give you bookkeeping uh, accounting software. We're going to give you free accounting uh, services and free bookkeeping services and legal services and everything else. And the full complete website, two websites, as a matter of fact, that we designed for you. And you use them as your own business websites and to sell products and yours and so on. So it's uh, $21.97 to join and become one of us and forty nine dollars a month however we don't want anyone taking advantage of these next two offers but if you have to 
we will understand. It's not the best thing in the world for you, but it might be a better thing for us than the 2197. But the, the, the other options are this. Plan A is the 2197. Plan B is you'll partner with us on the transactions that you do for a year, or at least on the first three transactions, we can let you in as a full complete affiliate for $11.97 and $49 a month. Plan C, if you want to partner with us for the entire three years, then you could come in for a little under $600 and $49 a month. Now, again, the best bargain that we have is plan A. So we'd discourage you from doing anything else, even though after your first three transactions, you can step up from plan B up to plan A if you want to and uh, just pay the difference. And then with plan C, it's the same thing. After your first six transactions, you can step up to B or A, whichever one you feel that you can afford at that time. And hopefully by that time, you'd be able to afford to buy my company. Uh, I'll sell it to you today for $482 million. So you got two choices, guys. <clears throat> you can keep everything in your life just the way it is today and don't bother with me. Uh, trust nobody, especially me, to help you improve it or change any of it. That's your prerogative. And if you like the way things are, keep them that way. However, the other option is to find and place your trust and someone of proven competence and experience to guide you through the life alterations that you know with absolute certainty have to be made. With or without them, you've got to do it. That's two choices that you have. So with that, we're going to end the presentation. I'm going to thank you very much for bearing with us all this time. And I hope this presentation has made a big difference in your life. And if you want to join us and become an affiliate with us and be part of our company and all of our programs, we would be absolutely honored. So thank you again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time.